during episodes. So this was a, an IV topiary that had been brought into our clinic some time ago. And you can look at the symptoms when you look at the overall plant in its entirety, the leaves are drying out, it's wilting, it's drooping. It gives all the exact same symptoms that you would see if a plant was underwater. So this is why I was trying to explain that the symptoms in the plant will express themselves in the same way. The only way we really know what's going on is by looking at the root system. So in this case, we lifted out the pot and you can see, if you look, uh, if you can see closely in there, the roots on that plant, uh, how they're, they're, they're brown, they're dark brown. And if you could uh, peel them with your fingers, you'd see they're mushy and they're just kind of teased right apart in, the, in your hand. On a healthy to plant, plant, the uh, roots should be a nice white color that's going on in there. So that's really the best way to know is to pull it out of the pot and look at and examine the roots. And if they are brown and mushy and deteriorated, then take your fingers, take a clean pair of scissors. We trim away, get rid of all the brown mushy stuff, try to get back to a healthy root zone and repot it into a, a good porous drainage mix. The other thing, um, and when we come back here, I want to show you a little bit about watering and the importance of selecting pots that have good drainage. So we talked about having a soil media that's um, has very good drainage in there. And let's pretend you just bought this beautiful anthurium for your sweetheart for Valentine's Day. And this is what I'm talking about. If you can see in here where the roots, you can see how nice and white and plump and turgid they are. So that's a good healthy root system. Uh, they're in this grower's pot, which has a series of drainage holes in the bottom. And because that's not so pretty and we want to present it as a gift, I could pot it up in here. You'll see where I have a drainage hole in the bottom there. Absolutely, I think it needs to have a drainage hole in there so the excess moisture can escape from there. And the best way to water this plant really is to take it over to your kitchen sink. Water it thoroughly. Just put it on that kitchen sink, either with a gentle water or your watering can. Water it until that water just drains all the way through that drains, draining out the bottom of the pot. And once it's thoroughly moistened, then you can put it back you know, on your coffee table or, or wherever you have it. And I just put here a little cover there to protect the surface of the table. So when, let's say you came in here and you decided to get your sweetie a beautiful streptocarpus for Valentine's Day. Uh, this is in the same family as African violets. It gets the same care, same kind of treatment. Um, beautiful little plant that you might want to share with somebody special. Um, Again, it's, it's growing the same way. Grower's pot has the holes in here, but you'll notice again, we want to make it look pretty. Uh -huh. No drainage holes. Uh, so this is just a, a little catch pot. It's just there to make it look pretty. You would not use this for growing. You can put it in here just for presentation, make it look pretty, but take your plant over the sink to water it thoroughly. So this is real basic stuff, but I just, I had to say it because it's usually the basics that we get wrong and that's where we see problems go in. Uh, but enough about watering. Like I say, what I really came today, our primary topic was to talk about pests, uh, when things start to go wrong indoors. So I'm gonna start out with a few pictures of just some of the common pest problems that you can encounter on tropical plants and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about how we control and manage them. So spider mites, um, are tiny, tiny, tiny. These are highly magnified pictures. Uh, I personally, I cannot see mites with my naked eye. I need magnification on there. Uh, 20 years ago, I could see them uh, without a magnifying glass. So if you've got really sharp eyesight, you might be able to see them, but they're not much bigger than a speck of dust. And what these are, these are, these are not, technically they're not insects, they're arachnids, uh, more closely related to spiders uh, in that they have eight legs and two body parts. But think of their mouth, their mouthpiece is like a little pincher. And so what they're doing is they're biting the leaf. They bite into that leaf to rupture the cells and then they drink up the cell sap and the contents that come in there. The two spotted spider mite, which you can see in that little inset, and then that's their egg that's right next to them and spider mites can reproduce really fast. Uh, 
they can go from an egg to an adult in less than 10 days. And the warmer and the drier it is, the faster and more prolific they are in their reproduction. So a lot of times indoors uh, with the heat on, the humidity low, um, in these conditions, they get going really fast. When you get large populations, uh, and at this point, you're really getting out of control, you'll start to see that webbing like I have in that larger image where they literally just, not a defined sculpted web, but you just see this, this irregular kind of webbing there and you'll see their mites and you'll see their cast skins. And, and like I said, and they're, they're just sucking the juice out of the plant. It gets what we call stippled look. It starts losing its discoloration and it just deteriorates and goes down from here. So spider mites are almost ubiquitous. You know, they attack a lot of different plants, both inside and outside. So that's one that um, we, we're always on constant vigilance for. A couple others that are very commonly encountered and they don't even look like insects, but these are true insects. Uh, mealybug and scale, they're closely related. Uh, we refer to them again as piercing sucking insects. Their mouth part, it's like a little hypodermic needle. Um, and they just insert that mouthpiece into the uh, plant tissue and they start drawing and sucking sap out of the plant. Um, and as they do that, as they're ingesting the sap of the plant through their mouth, then they'll start to excrete um, excess sap out their rear end, which we, uh, it, it causes this sticky substance to go around. So a lot of times uh, you might have scale, which are difficult to see because they're not necessarily crawling around, moving around. You don't see all the body parts. Uh, oftentimes they're on the underside, the leaf, they may not be readily visible, but if you've ever walking around, you notice the floor on your plant sticky. You go walking there and your feet are on this tacky surface. That's a usually a pretty telltale sign that we have what's called a brown scale problem. So the mealybug is that white one that's kind of cottony, fluffy looking. Uh, a lot of times people think it's some kind of a disease, but that's actually, it's an insect that covers itself with that white waxy filamentous cover as a protective cover. The other pictures is we call it's a brown soft scale. Again, it's a true insect, but they're sedentary. They, they tap into the vascular tissue of plants, start feeding, start feeding and cover themselves under that waxy sh shell, usually on the underside of the leaf. So you actually have to look for them, but if you feel that stickiness on the floor or on the plant leaves, that's usually a real good sign that somewhere we've got this scale problem to deal with. And what's coming up next? I forgot what else I put in there. Oh yeah, everybody's favorite, the fungus gnats. Uh, fungus gnats are just that, they're gnats. They don't bite, they don't sting. Uh, they really don't cause significant damage to plants. They're a nuisance though. Um, they are attracted to bright lights. So you'll find them just kind of buzzing around your house and sometimes not even where the plants are located. I'm having a little bit of a small issue with them at my home. And I was like, every once in a while, up in the, even the upstairs bathroom or downstairs in the kitchen, they will go travel pretty much wherever if you have a light on, sometimes around the windows. Uh, so they're, they're drawn to those kind of conditions. And even though they're not harmful, um, you know, nobody likes to have little bugs, you know, buzzing around the house. It's just, it's just an annoyance. Um, and then because they are attracted to that, that bright yellow color, What's showing there, and I'll give you a little more detail on, is that's a sticky trap that we can use to actually capture these things. Now, the deal is their larvae, the, the little tiny maggots, they develop down in the soil, in the potting mix. They feed on decaying organic matter. So the compost and the peat and the stuff that's contained in the soil media, as it's rotting and decaying, the larvae feed on that. Uh, they, they like the warm, moist environment that's there. So again, as we bring plants into the, into the house and into our living areas uh, and we're keeping them watered and you create this condition, then these little gnats start buzzing around. So these are really the pests that I see showing up at the clinic. And I'm gonna talk about each one of them in a little bit of detail and how we can go about controlling and managing these pests. But uh, before I jump into the control, we got any questions coming in there, Sally? 
Yeah, we've had a few come in. Um, one is related to watering. Um, so I'll start with that one since it's probably relevant to everybody. Um, do brown tips on leaves typically indicate overwatering or underwatering? Uh, brown tips on the leaf, it's usually, it's gonna be either underwatering. Um, so it's that the plant is what we call, it's transpiring. It's, it's losing water through its leaves faster than it's being replenished through the roots. So I will see that sometimes with low humidity because a lot of times in the, when we have our heat on in the house, uh, you know, you might have be lucky to have a humidity of 20% in your home at some times. And you're talking about tropical plants that want to be in like 50, 70, 80, 90% humidity. So I am a, a believer like in misting plants, grouping them together, putting humidity trays around, anything that boosts the humidity can help. You'll also see that if they're just not getting watered enough, uh, and that can lead to the brown tips. The third thing that I run into, but it's probably less common, is there are some plants that are sensitive to the fluoride that we put in our drinking water, and that will sometimes accumulate and lead to the brown tips. So it's, it is a moisture problem most of the time, but there's a little guesswork to exactly what's doing that. That makes sense. Thank you, David. Um, all right. I know you're going to be going a little, a little bit more detail to some of these issues that you've discussed. Um, we have one more question about watering. Um, are there any plants when you're talking about looking at the brown roots, are there any plants where the brown roots are like, it's kind of naturally that way? Like you might look at it like the fern is what one person asked if they have, if their fern has brown roots, is that a problem usually or is, does it vary plant to plant? Oh, that's a good question. I, I would not have thought about it. It's true. Ferns, ferns a lot of times just naturally have brown roots. They're, ferns are a little different because they, what we're actually growing, it's a, it's a rhizome. When you're on the surface of the ground, there's stem tissue and then the fronds emerge from that, the roots below. And so they will sometimes, they have a little different root structure and you'll see brown roots on there. But that's really the exception. Every, every other plant I can think of when they're young, healthy, vibrant, growing, and they're active in absorbing water and nutrients for the plant, they're going to be a white or a creamy color. Now, just like um, leaves, leaves get old, they mature, they drop off, process we call about senescence. Roots will do the same thing where roots, you know, hey, as they get old and they get mature, uh, they sometimes on, on trees and shrubs, they get woody. Um, at that point, they turn brown on some tropical plants, they may just naturally die, but they aren't, they aren't functioning as well. The ones that are actually functional of and sustaining the plant are going to be white in color. So that's something I, I'm just going to follow up on that real quick. Cause when we're repotting, one of the things we'll do is we'll go through and sometimes we'll slough off with our fingers. We'll, we'll tease out and pull away those old dead uh, roots that are not functional. I think that's one of the things that can help kind of reinvigorate the plant. Um, and so during our repotting process, uh, we may take some of that out and just get back to the healthy functional roots. Thank you, David. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I just want to go over, so you're going to be covering, we've have a few people asking questions on specific plants controlling either scale, um, other types of issues that you've discussed. Are you going to be covering some of those control methods? Yeah. Well, let's do that right now, and then uh, we'll take a few questions along the way if I'm if I'm leaving anything out. Excellent, thank you. So this this um I gotta say it, but it's uh I should say common sense. Our first step on on any of this thing, and I keep making these kind of analogies to what we're going through with this pandemic. Um, our first line of defense is always going to just be sanitation, um, trying to keep the area clean, trying to prevent any of these problems uh, from occurring. So the same way that we may wear a mask and keep distance from each other to prevent the spread, you always want to you know, buy plants that are good condition and free of pests and everything to start with. So a lot of times, like if they've been outside for the summer, you might bring the plants in um, and treat them, spray them prior to bringing in the house to make you sure you don't bring unwanted plants in here. It's not a bad idea sometimes to keep new plants quarantined. Uh, you know, and I'm saying maybe maybe up to you know two weeks, four weeks, 
keep them away from the other plants just to make sure you're not accidentally introducing something in. Um, and then beyond that, like we, we're constantly vigilant and we're always trying to watch and keep any pest controls, pests under control. But let's, let's pretend sometimes you bring a new plant in the house, there's no pests on it, but maybe there's a few eggs that go unnoticed. And then two weeks later, you start to see problems occur. Uh, washing plants, just, just rinsing them off, you know, the gentle stream of water uh, is always a good measure. So we're always going to sort of take the, the easiest way out first. If you're in that situation, though, let's back up and say, okay, hey, so for whatever reasons, um, now you've got a problem. I'll talk about spider mites as the beginning. Um, it's really, really difficult to control some of these pests with indoor gardening because none of these sprays, none of these treatments I'm talking to you about can be correctly used indoors uh, because whether it's a pesticide, whether we'll, I'll show you some organic options and some uh, chemical options, but none of these are for use inside your living area. So this means, hey, I need to take the plant into a, into a garage or maybe a basement utility room kind of area. Preferably you're taking it outdoors, but in the middle of winter when it's, when it's freezing cold outside, you really can't even take the plants outdoors. So I'm going to show you some sprays that work, but the practicality of it comes into where I'm also trying to be really clear. This is something that's best done outdoors, you know, or but temperatures need to be, you know, above ideally above 50 degrees when you're doing it. If you don't have that, then maybe you're fortunate enough where you've got a garage or well ventilated spot that you can do that. So spider mites. One of the things I emphasize is a lot of your traditional insecticides, things that control insects, don't necessarily control spider mites. So if you have a significant spider mite problem, that's where I brought a couple things in, for example. You'll notice on this one, I don't know if you can see it, but this actually contains a miticide. This is called insect disease and mite control. So it actually specifies it's for mites it will confuse you a lot of time because it's saying in here for, for use on roses, flowers, and shrubs. But once you peel open and you read the label in detail, it is also labeled for use on tropical plants, house plants, it's in there. So it is an approved use. This does a very good job, but keep in mind what happens when we're talking about spider mites I'd mentioned, you can go from egg to an adult in seven to 14 days. So that means you're gonna to have to do repeat spraying. So I would, I would spray it, you know, wait 10 or 14 days, spray it a second time, wait 10 or 14 days, wait a third time, spray it 10 or, you know, 10 or 14 days later. So these things require vigilance. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And oftentimes, many times when you're at the clinic, I'm talking to you about how much is this plant worth to you? Um, do you want to invest the time and the effort and the energy um, and the money into treating something like this or based on the value of the plant, maybe it's something you just toss it away in the trash. I know that's heartless, but over time you kind of get that way. There are some organic products for me again with spider mites. Hey David, sorry, can you yeah. can you get say the name of the product? Okay, yeah. So the one in the blue bottle here, the name of the company is called Bio Advanced, B I O A B I O A D A V A N C E D, Bio Advanced. Um, and this is called Three in One Insect Disease and Mite Control. Now, this one yep. I'm showing you right here, and I'll come back to these time and time again. The horticultural oil uh, is a go to product for me in a lot of ways. It's a um, it's, it's a petroleum oil. It's a very highly distilled, highly refined petroleum oil that we use for pest control. So this particular one that we sell is called all season horticultural spray oil. Uh, but what's nice is it's a natural product. You're spraying the plant, the top of the leaves, the bottom of the leaves, the stems, the twigs, you have to get good coverage on there. Um, and the oil films the coating over, over the mites over their eggs as well. So this also destroys the eggs, it kills the mites, and it's a, a non-toxic material. So again, I'm a big fan of the horticultural oil, 
but we still have that same issue where it needs to be done outdoors or utility room because again, if, if you spray oil, it's gonna, it's gonna stain fabrics and upholstery and walls and stuff. So, so it's not always a risk matter, but it's also just kind of a, a cleanliness and um, convenience issue. So that's the all seasons horticultural oil. And you can buy these things in different sizes. I'm just showing the ones that are ready to use right out the squirt bottle. Uh, real quickly, just uh, I'll mention neem oil. This is again, another natural product. It's, I always think of it like olive oil, but it's pressed from the seed of a neem tree, a tropical tree. Um, it's one that's very popular. I think there's a lot of um, people on the internet that are promoting this because uh, we've been the past year just selling lots and lots. I've even had trouble keeping it in. Um, in my experience, the horticultural oil, the petroleum-based oil to me gives better results than the neem does. Uh, but either one of these, it's the same idea where we're trying to use an oil-based product basically to um, suffocate these pests. Um, again, you can just, just washing them off under a stream of water in your sink can help. But when you get a heavy infestation, you might need to go that route if we're dealing with mites. Uh, I'll just keep going then a couple others because we talked a little bit about the scale and the mealybug. Uh, scale and mealybug, because they tap into the plant with their mouth parts and they're drawing sap um, up into their bodies. In this case, we have an option where we can use systemic treatments. So this is where we don't have to do any spraying. And most of the time, those of us working at the clinic, we're gonna talk to you about one of these two products. Um, these use the same insecticide. They're just packaged differently. Um, this one again from BioAdvanced, uh, which they call the Plant Food Plus Insect Control Spike. This is a systemic insecticide, but it's put in a little tablet form. So you take this little applicator and you push the tablet down into the soil. As it dissolves, it's absorbed from the roots, it migrates up into the plant and controls the pests they're feeding on that way. So this is a great option in many ways uh, because, because we avoid that whole issue of spraying. You can just do it inside. It's super convenient, it's effective, but it's slow acting. It takes a little time to make it into the plant. And for example, this is something you need to do about once every six to eight weeks. This does not control spider mites. That's why I'm putting it out there as a separate thing. These products, and this is the same thing, except here it's a granule. So this one, you can just sprinkle on the surface of the ground. Uh, but these actually increase spider mite populations. So it's, it's important that we do get the problem assessed quickly. But if you've got mealybug scale, um, you can do these in combination. You can spray the plant with an oil and use systemic treatments on it. So you can use them by themselves. You can uh, do them together. Uh, just again, all this stuff, let me say, I don't want to be doing this if you're growing vegetables or herbs or any edible plants. I'm talking about strictly ornamental plants right here today. Um, edible plants, we would speak to that differently. So, that, so these are some of the techniques that we have. Uh, but again, if the, if the pest gets out of control, um, it can quickly get to where you start wondering, is it really worth the trouble uh, based on the value of the plant? Another little tidbit, uh, I'll just kind of feel like I'm rambling on here, but it's, it's more than a tidbit, this is significant. What I've been saying here is just about treating the plant. It's equally as important that we clean the area around the plant. There is a study that I looked at that was done um, in a commercial greenhouse. Uh, I, was, I was looking at this about a year ago and they had mealybug problems. And in one group in sort of test block A, they were treating the plants with the products, with the insecticides I'm showing you here today. Um, block A, they just treated the plants. Kind of block B, they treated the plants, but they also cleaned the area around the plants. They cleaned the ventilation fans, they cleaned the surfaces, they cleaned under the tables, they cleaned under the floors. The ones that got the treatment plus the cleaning, they were able to get total control of mealybug with two applications. The other ones where they were just treating the plant but not cleaning the surroundings, 
They had done, I think, three, even four applications and still did not have control of the problem. Mealybugs, for example, they can live up to 45 days outside of the pot. So you could, let's say I'm treating my plant for mealybugs, but I could have eggs or, or little tiny nymphs hiding uh, in little cracks or crevices or windowsills and coming back to reinfesting the plant. So again, this, this, the importance of sanitation and keeping the area clean. I was down there in the greenhouse and the ladies, so they're, they're always, always fastidiously cleaning and cleaning in there. You'll see them cleaning the floors, cleaning the countertops. Um, it's a really effective way of helping control these pests also. So you, we want to take any questions or I can go Thanks, on. David. There. Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, first of all, could you go through again and name we're having, we can't quite see the names of the products. So we've had a few people just ask if you can repeat okay. the product names that you just reviewed. Yeah. And these product names, you know, they're, that is a whole big mess. One of the reasons I kind of um, avoid the topic, for example, try not confuse it. But this product here is it, the technical name on it is called imidacloprid. But because nobody just walks in and asks for imidacloprid, we give it catchy names. You know, the, the marketing people get in here. So we can put it, like I said, in this tablet form and just call it, you know, plant food plus systemic control spike, the exact same insecticide that then this company takes, high yield takes it, and they just, they're calling systemic insect granules. Uh, so a lot of times that's one of the things that we can do for you, the plant clinic is, is we're kind of helping to decipher all these things. But the two I'm showing you here today, and I don't want you to get too hung up on the exact names is what I'm saying, is high yield systemic insect granules. This is kind of like the generic version. Uh, this is the no frills which we started to offer because it's a tremendously good price, a really good value. And you can see kind of the old school, no frills packaging. This is the same insecticide, but it's put into much nicer packaging. Um, the tablets are easy to use. So the names can change based on the manufacturer that's there. Those are the two I'm showing you today. And they're both called um, just systemic insect granules or insect control spikes. Yeah, and I'm sorry you can't see the uh, images exactly, but those are a couple. Okay, I know myself products. and members of the team have been working on getting some higher quality video, but I know we're not there yet. But um, we have a number of other questions. You don't want me to, want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah, because I, I want to make sure we answer the questions. The rest of this stuff is just, you know, trivia. Um, okay, so the first question relates to something we haven't discussed yet about powdery mildew. Do you have any recommendations for controlling that? This person is specifically asking about African violets, but I know it's not only a problem on African violets. Yeah, so let me say on the disease front, um, and I didn't bring any good examples in here, on the disease front, with, with tropical plants, most of our foliage plants, uh, we're, we're often dealing with bacterial leaf spots, and with a bacterial leaf spot, you'll see the center of the spot. It can sometimes looks like a bullseye pattern. And right in the center, it might be black or dark brown and kind of gets a yellow haloing around it. The problem with um, diseases, uh, mildew is a fungal infection. It just kind of leaves this kind of whitish gray mold on the leaf. The problem with these fungal infections goes back again. There are really our only measures are, are spraying. And that's difficult to do indoors, like we've talked about. So if we can manage this problem just by cutting off the bad leaf, if I've got one or two leaves that have a, a spot on them, we'll generally recommend just removing that leaf um, and, and just throwing that leaf away because spraying is so difficult. If, and, and I, actually I'm going to answer the mildew question, but it's going to come up in just a second. Um, if you actually get to the point where it's a valuable plant or you need to do something, this um, copper fungicide, and that's it just like a copper penny, C-O-P-P-E-R, copper fungicide, again, is a natural product, but it leaves a blue stain. So it's something you definitely need to be doing outside. So that's kind of our last resort on most of the tropical plants. Now you really, I would not be using this on an African violet. 
because on African violet, I'm concerned that the blue coloration of it would discolor the flowers and stuff. Mildew, uh, which we'll see on African violets, um, it's sometimes if you're growing rosemary or herbs inside. Uh, mildew, actually, that's one of the places that these oils, like neem oil, is labeled for control of mildew. Um, the horticultural oil is also labeled for control of mildew. But you cannot use this if they are in bloom. The oil basically uh, permeates into the, the, the tissue, the petals, and just turns the flowers to mush. So there, there are some times uh, you just sacrifice the flowers, pinch the flowers off, and spray them with the horticultural oil or neem oil is one option that's out there. Uh, Mildew is kind of where temperatures are typically 75, 85 degrees in high humid conditions. So it comes up, goes a little bit um, with things. Interestingly, mildew is one of the few fungal infections. It does not need water to infect the plant. Uh, it just needs high humidity. But to the extent we can, keeping the foliage dry, keeping good air circulation around there helps. Uh, but with African violets, most of the growers I know are using something like the neem oil, uh, but they're having to use that in between bloom cycles or sacrifice the flowers. Thank you, David. Um, the next question is about scale. This person specifically asked about controlling scale on their jade plant. Do you have any recommendations for that? Uh, the horticultural oil works fairly well on that. But again, because we have the limitations, we have the issues of being able to spray indoors. That's typically when I go with either the systemic tablets um, or the um, systemic granules. You know, one of these two products to me is the best way to, to manage scale in there. Uh, now, sometimes uh, with vigilance, um, just, you know, scraping them off with your thumbnail um, can, can work if it's a very low level infestation, but it's been my experience, they get into like the little nooks and crannies and hiding spaces that you can't see them or you can't get in there with your fingernail, or even, uh, you know, if you're sitting down, you know, watching a movie and taking your time to clean them out individually, I just haven't had great success with that myself. So you can combine these things and one, just remove what you can, you know, with your thumbnail and then use um, a systemic granule to catch the immature ones and stop them from coming back is probably how I would go about it. And it takes some time. It's going to take a week or two for this material to actually get into the plant. And then it's going to be killing the, the immatures gradually. So it's something you'll, you'll need to stick with it for a couple times, you know, two, three applications before you see success. Thanks, David. Um, all right. So the next questions are about neem oil and horticultural oil. Um, does and I don't have any experience with these, so I think you'll probably know what the question is asking, even though I don't. Will horticultural oil burn leaves like neem oil does? Is the question. Uh, it can discolor them. Um, I don't want to necessarily use the word burn. Um, what will happen is, and and particularly like succulents, um, for example, you know, if if they've got a little bit of a that bluish coloration on them or something it will sort of take, sometimes we refer to as a bloom, it will take that color off of them. So there are some plants that may show a sensitivity to it. Uh, neem, well, the horticultural oil, it should be used when temperatures are about 50 to, I'm gonna say a high of 80 degrees. If we go into high temperatures and high humidities, you know, above 80, under those conditions you can get burning. Um, so it's a little bit uh, temperature sensitive, but if you use it within that, uh, and all this information on the label, if you're using it within the approved temperature range and all you're doing, I, I say this is kind of like when you're cleaning your county tops or cleaning the windows, you know, you're just putting a fine spray on there. It, you don't want it dripping, soaking wet. If it's, if it's dripping and soak off the plant, you're over applying it at that point. But if you use a, a reasonable amount of, um, of spray, you know, without overdoing it, and you're within those temperature ranges, I've never had any incidents of burning with it. 
Thanks, David. Um, next question comes from a few people about fungus gnats. So I'm going to go over a couple of things. Uh, we've had one person say they've tried everything. They have the sticky traps. They still have an infestation of fungus gnats. And now they're dreading trying to put out any of their plants again this year because it got so bad last year. Um, one person said that they've heard that fungus gnats don't harm the plants, but they're wondering if it's possible for them to harm the seeds when they germinate. They've experienced some issues with the basil plants. Um, so just some people asking for help in general with, sounds like re some really terrible fungus gnat infestations. That's, that's probably the number one pest that we get at the clinic, um, you know, this time of year with indoor gardens. And I don't have a foolproof answer for you. Uh, when, when they build up to really high populations, they can do some damage to uh, small plants and seedlings. So they, they, they can and will feed on the plant roots. Um, but most of the time, if it's a vigorous, well-established plant, it's not a significant source of damage to it. But that's, there's a little bit of qualifications on there. So they can cause some damage. I'll just tell you what's been giving us our, our best success. Again, it's not, it's not foolproof. Uh, but again, I, I'm, I don't own stock in this company. I'm not trying to sell for anything, but, but it is labeled for use on fungus gnats, these systemic granules. Uh, again, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but you can use this and we'll recommend doing that as a way to treat the larvae that are in the soil while at the same time putting these sticky yellow traps out to capture the adults that are buzzing around. Because these glue traps, as you know, they're taking down the nuisance level a little bit. They're trying to capture the adults that are flying around before they have an opportunity to lay their eggs back into the pot. And then we're using these um, systemic granules to try to get the larvae that are in there. Now, a couple other options uh, that are available to you within that. That's sort of our been our most reliable treatment of uh, another thing. I know I brought it here, my show and tell. So these mosquito bits, uh, you might be familiar with mosquito bits uh, because they control fly larvae. And that's what the gnats, the fungus gnats are fly larvae in the soil. This people like it because it's a 100% natural organic treatment. Uh, it's been around a long, long time. This is a little granule. I don't know if you can really see it in there, but it's called it's mosquito bits. Our name is same thing you might put in your bird bath or your downspout drains or something like that for controlled mosquitoes. You can put this in the flower pots and the bacteria that are in here work their way into the soil to kill the larvae. The reason I get kind of less excited about this or put it just as an option, they use this kind of um, broken up corn cob is the carrier on there. And when you have these sitting on the surface of the soil for a period of time, because you're watering it in, they kind of, they start to get moldy. And then next thing you know, is like, oh, hey, I'm trying to get my fungus gnats under control, but I got this like moldy junk on top of them. And that's not too appealing either. So this has been um, something we've played around with. We've tried putting it in the water and stuff. It's an option. It works. It's natural. So there's a lot of good things to say about it, but the convenience side of it, because the pots get kind of a little bit moldy and funky, um, that's not quite as favorable. Uh, also, and, and I've heard this recommendation, but again, it hasn't really been that effective to me. Um, allowing, allowing your plants to dry out between watering uh, can also help to mitigate some of the gnats because they are somewhat dependent on the moisture in the soil. But that hasn't been foolproof for me because we got to water our plants. We started out the talk on that. So I'm usually going to tell you, try the uh, systemic granules along with the um, traps. Uh, repotting is also a consideration. If you don't just have one or two small plants, maybe you take it out, wash out the old soil, and repot it into fresh soil. That's a good idea. Um, here's our next question. It's from someone who has a lemon, a uh, lemon tree. Um, so she says, I have a ponderosa lemon that has spider mites. I can't destroy the plant. Um, is it possible? She's tried Castile soap and neem oil, um, but that it's not working to get rid of the spider mites. So is it possible for her to apply pesticides and wait a year to eat the fruit as a last resort? Uh, really the, I just don't think you need to go that way, give that route. Um, it would be possible, um, to answer your question. So this, this 
three and one, the insect disease and mite, it specifically has a miticide in there. Again, like I said, it's not for use on uh, food crops or edible plants. Uh, but, but if, like I said, if you're not eating that fruit, you know, for, for the next year, that's an option that's there. I've had pretty good success with being vigilant and using the horticultural oil, which is a natural product. It's approved for use on food trees. You, it wouldn't interfere with your ability to use uh, the lemons. So the problem, again, I guess that's with both of them is you can't do the spraying inside the house. You know, it needs to be done in a outdoor utility area. But if you do the horticultural oil, I think it gives you better results. Do it on like a, um, about a 10 to 14 day cycle. If you can make three applications, um, that, that's probably the route I would suggest you go. Thanks, David. Um, do you have any recommendations for treating rust spot? Rust? Rust spots? Uh, again, you know, something like the copper would work, but you'd need to do that outdoors. Are we talking about tropical plants? Because we don't, we don't often get rust uh, or really have much of a fungal plant there. So you, you know, I you can always know. Um, we'll, we can wait and see if this person is still on, if they can message us and let us know if it's tropical. Yeah, I'd like send, send me an email because something I'm, I'm not quite understanding. It might become Definitely. an ornamental plant outside. And yeah, there's ways that we can do that. Yeah, and that's a good note to anybody because um, we are coming close to being up on time. If you all have questions after this, you're welcome to email uh, me, send us a Facebook message, or you can contact David at the plant clinic. Um, we're happy to follow up. Um, all right, so one more question. Um, this person has a begonia that they put on their front stoop in the summer. Um, when they brought the plant back in, it started drying up and becoming brown and losing leaves almost like it was over watering, but he doesn't think that's what happened. He thinks it might've been some kind of infestation. Does that sound like a familiar concept or is that something you should follow up on? Uh, again, you know, I, I always feel better if I can look at pictures or something, make a diagnosis because begonias, you know, we'll get mildew problems with them uh, depending on exactly what type of mildew. I mean, a lot type of begonia, a lot of the ones that we have in our greenhouse right now, they like the cooler temperatures of winter so I don't want to, you know, if it's a real a room where the heat's turned on, you know, low humidity, that can uh, put some damage on. But that, that could be a disease. Like I said, they do get some, some leaf spot diseases. I don't think it's an insect problem. Um, but, but like I said, we get mildew shows up on them and some other fungal leaf spots. Thanks, David. Um, so this person about the rust spot followed up and said it is a tropical plant. Um, so like I said, just want to remind everybody as we're coming up on time, if you all have questions about your specific plants that we didn't get to, we're happy to answer those. And you're welcome to send me an email with pictures. Um, pictures are always helpful for David, I know. So um, I do have one more question before our time is up. Uh, it's about the mosquito bits and the systemic granules. Are those safe for vegetables or any edible kind of plants? Uh, so real quick, if you're going to send me pictures, what I like is to have a close-up of the, uh, the leaf spot or a close-up of the, of the problem, and then also step back and get, get, send me an image of the plant's entirety so we can kind of see the distribution and pattern on it. Uh, now, this, the, um, this, the mosquito bits, absolutely, this is 100% organic. You can use it on frown food crops, you know, no problems whatsoever on that. Of uh, the systemic treatment, it it kind of bothers me a little bit because I think I'm trying to look in here real quick. I'd want to read the label because sometimes I find this is labeled for use on food crops, but it's nothing I would ever recommend for putting on my food crops because this is absorbed in through the entire plant. The pesticides absorbed up into the leaves, into the flowers into the fruits. So for me, it's strictly for ornamental plants. All right. Thank you, David. I know we're about out of time. It's 246. Um, thank you guys, all of you for joining us today. Um, like I said, if we didn't get to your questions, we are happy to follow up. Um, the plant clinic is always available to answer questions. Even if you're not comfortable coming into the store, we can handle your questions by email or by phone. David, is there anything you want to close with before we wrap up? Uh, just real quick, I, I also, in my, my volunteer job, I work as a training coordinator for the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Um, and the Master Gardeners also host a couple of online plant clinics. If you want to learn about that, go to 
fairfaxgardening.org. So it's just all one word, fairfaxgardening.org. And that's another good source of help and information for your plants and gardening. Definitely. Yeah, I know they have some good information. David, thank you so much. Everybody, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and wrap up and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for our next virtual plant clinic. Everybody have a good afternoon.